All right, welcome in everybody, Tuesday Night Bible Study. We are nearing the end of our journey through the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we are going to be doing chapters 25 and 26 tonight, and God willing, we'll be doing chapters 27 and 28 next week, which are the final two chapters. Uh, that'll give us a good break point, uh, because after that, we enter into Great and Holy Lent. So it'll be a nice place for us to, to stop our, our study and then... Uh, end our study, I should say, and then move forward with a more intensified worship life um, when we get into Great Lent. So that's that's the goal, is to get through uh, to get through the end of the book uh, next week. So uh, just a recap where we left off uh, with chapters 23 and 24, which we covered last week. St. Paul was in Jerusalem uh, for the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, he was arrested there and he was beaten by the Jews in the temple outside the temple. They threw him out of the temple and they were beating him and intended on killing him. Uh, but the Roman army came and swooped him up and, and took him uh, to safety in order to bring him to trial. So he stands trial before the Sanhedrin, before the Jewish high court. And as Paul's giving his testimony to the Jewish leadership, a riot breaks out. They're very upset with what he's saying. So they start rioting. And he's again kind of whisked away by the Romans into the barracks. Uh, they, the Jews, uh, some Jewish zealots had formed a plot to kill St. Paul uh, as he was brought back to court the next day. Uh, but St. Paul learns about this through his nephew, informs the commander of the Roman army, and he is immediately sent to Caesarea by night, escorted by, what was it, 400 470 soldiers of the Roman army uh, who take him to a certain point and then the 70 uh, horsemen take him the rest of the way to Caesarea. So under heavy guard, he makes it to Caesarea, which of course is a Roman uh, city. And there he stands trial again before the governor, Felix. So his accusers come to Caesarea. They hold a trial there. And Felix, uh, he doesn't condemn him. But he doesn't release him either, right? He, he doesn't want to upset the Jews by releasing St. Paul. He doesn't want to condemn St. Paul because there's no real charges against him. There's certainly nothing worthy of death. Uh, and he's a Roman citizen, so he's not just going to, you know, he's, he's not just going to condemn him for no reason. Uh, and so he's held as a prisoner with, I mean, basically under house arrest. He's held as a prisoner for two years um without release in Caesarea so he remains in Caesarea for two years uh basically under house arrest at the end of chapter 24 uh Felix the governor is replaced by Festus uh, so we have a new governor who as we begin chapter 25 is now going to hear St. Paul's case again so St. Paul's continually being brought to trial but again we'll, we'll talk one of the things we'll talk about tonight is that it can it's giving continually giving him opportunities to share his experiences, to testify to the gospel, and uh, to um, speak to more and more people, not just you know your everyday Gentile peasants out in the countryside in Greece, but now even Roman authorities and governors and, and higher-ups in, in the Roman authority structure. So uh, every, every, uh, every what we would think about as a negative turn for St. Paul is for him another opportunity to preach. So with that, we will start with chapter 25, verse 1. Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem, while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. So even though St. Paul has been imprisoned for two years, as soon as the new governor comes and goes to, to Jerusalem, what do they ask? What's the favor that they ask about St. Paul, right? So they, they have this mania, you know, they're, they're completely absorbed by, uh, the work and teachings of St. Paul, and they really want to get rid of him. Now, it's probable, too, that he was continually writing. You know, he was writing during this time, probably. Um, and as people could come and visit him, he may have been, again, speaking with, you know, other Christian leaders from the area, various areas. And so they saw him still as a threat to what they were doing. 
Um, but it goes to make a point, right? That they're 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 kind of like bloodthirstiness for Saint Paul is like insatiable. Like nothing will appease them until he's dead. Um, when it comes to Saint Paul, and so they have this plan that as he's being brought to Jerusalem, they're basically it's like the same plot that they had from before. They're gonna now they want to like resurrect that plan, and they're going to. Uh, uh, they're going to lay, they're going to ambush him basically is what they're planning. They're going to wait as he's being transported. They'll have a group there and ambush them. And uh, this will solve the problem. You know, this will solve the problem of St. Paul. It's unclear to me um, whether they propose this to Festus, including the ambush, right? Like, Hey, this prisoner has been here for two years. We know you don't want to deal with it anymore. Right? Like, bring him down to Jerusalem and we'll take care of it basically. Or if they were just asking to have the trial in Jerusalem and we're planning this on the side, Father Stephen de Young makes the case that like they presented this to Festus, like if you bring him to Jerusalem, we'll be waiting in the road and then you can just let us have our way because then this will kind of like stop the problem, you know, which the Romans were definitely not, you know, above. They definitely were. If they saw an easy way to handle a situation, then they would usually take that. But uh, Festus does not go for it because a uh, couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the the seat the seat of the governor is in Caesarea, so for him it's like a condescension, right? Like, okay, I'm I'm gonna come to you for the trial, right? Like, no, I'm the I'm the governor here. You're gonna come to me. Um, <clears throat> I have to think too, right? Like, Saint Paul's a Roman citizen. Like, why is he going to why is he going to go with this plan with these Jews? He doesn't even know them. Right. To kill a Roman citizen. Right. Like the Romans saw non-citizens basically as non-people. So it's like, so why am I going to follow your plan that you want to kill this Roman citizen? So in the end, he tells them that, no, you're going to need to come to Caesarea and he's going to stand trial as he should. Um, so this is another case of God using, again, a pagan person a pagan ruler to help and aid the divine plan for salvation so now we're in verse uh, six and when he had remained among them more than 10 days he went down to caesarea and the next day sitting on the judgment seat he commanded paul to be brought when he had come the jews who had come down from jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against paul which they could not prove while he answered for himself Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. So, St. Paul's trial begins immediately. This has all happened very fast, right? Like, Festus comes to Caesarea. Three days later, he goes to Jerusalem. They petition him immediately. And then he goes back to Caesarea after, like, a, what, what does it say, 10 days? And then uh, and then after, right, pretty much right away, there's a trial. So within like two or three weeks of Festus becoming the governor, this this is now taking, Paul's now standing trial again. So it shows, too, that Festus wants to, he believes he can resolve this, and he wants to handle it quickly. Uh, in, in describing here the kind of the process of the high court coming now again and accusing him and all these false accusations, St. Luke also is kind of, he wants us to connect in our mind, St. Paul and Jesus, right? During the passion of the Lord, uh, he's brought before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And this is a very similar scene, right? Like they're, they're trying to bring charges against him. Uh, their, their false witnesses are not agreeing with each other, right? So in the end, the high priest has to be like, tell us plainly, are you the, are you the Christ or not, right? Like because of the false, the false accusations, they're not, they're not adding up to anything. Um, so here we have St. Paul, right? The same thing is happening. There are all these people are basically like yelling and screaming and making all these charges, but they can't prove anything. So there's really nothing for, there's nothing for the governor to charge him with. Um, so, uh, St. Paul, all he basically, St. Paul says here is right. Like, I'm not guilty of anything, right. Of all these things they're saying, the charges they're making are threefold. First of all, against the Jews, right? St. Paul says, I'm neither against the, the uh, law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar. So against the Jews teaching, basically uh, they're complaining that he's teaching against Moses, against the temple, because remember they, they believe that he brought Greeks into the temple to profane it, or against Caesar by creating unrest and uh, chaos everywhere that he was going. So St. Paul basically says all these things are just untrue. 
But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he conferred with the consul, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. So Festus doesn't want to condemn St. Paul either. He's kind of like in the same boat that Felix was in. But he wants to curry favor with the Jews here, his subjects, right? And he doesn't want to start or get off on the, bed, on the wrong foot with them. So he kind of gets to a point now where he can't resolve, he feels like he can't resolve this dispute, he can't resolve the case without making somebody, he's either going to make the Jews angry or he's going to potentially, you know, break Roman law and make Caesar angry, which could, that could literally mean in his head. So now he's, he throws the idea out there to St. Paul, like, oh, would you go to Jerusalem? So he's basically now is resorting back. And this, this is a good reason why we could think that the Jews proposed this to him in the beginning. Um, He's basically going to plan B, which is what the Jews had proposed at first, right? Like to go to Jerusalem and have him killed on the way, right? So Festus is now saying, well, this is messier than I thought. If we, if we go with what the Jewish leadership had proposed in the beginning, we can get rid of him and be done with it, right? Uh, so I get, we see again and again in, in the life of St. Paul through his, through his imprisonment and all these different things, right? That the justice due to him is constantly being compromised by like political considerations. Um, so he, he's, ne he's never getting a fair shake. But again, like we said, um, although for us it seems very negative, for St. Paul it's giving him lots of opportunities to preach and share the gospel. So in the end, St. Paul, seeing, right, and understanding the situation, being a smart guy, right, he left Jerusalem under what conditions, right? They were planning on killing him. So he knows, right, oh, if I go back to Jerusalem, what are they going to do? They're going to try to kill me. So he doesn't want to do that. And he uses, he exercises the right that every Roman citizen had, which was to appeal to Caesar. So <clears throat> he plays that card, right? Knowing, seeing that he's not getting anywhere, he plays that card and says, okay, I appeal to Caesar. So every citizen had that right to appeal to Caesar. Now, that didn't necessarily mean that Caesar was going to hear your case, right? A lot of times Caesar would pass it off. You know, the emperor would pass it off to someone else or just, you know, write a response and say, well, do this or do that. Or, or the people would come to Rome awaiting trial and would basically just stay there under house arrest indefinitely. So there were a lot of different outcomes that could possibly happen, right? Like the, the probability of St. Paul standing in front of Caesar based on this case is, is very small, um, but he has the right to that appeal. So Festus uh, hears that and eagerly accepts, right? He, he definitely says, okay, fine. You want to go to Rome? Please, right? Get out of my hands. Uh, so he's, he's happy that St. Paul appeals to Caesar. Uh, he doesn't have to make a decision then, right? Like Festus is off the hook there for at least for a minute. So St. Paul is finally going to go to Rome, which is what he wants. He wants to go to Rome and what the Lord told him was going to happen. Uh, so now we're in verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. So a note on Agrippa. Agrippa is not, uh, when it says King Agrippa, he's not the Caesar, right? He's not the, he's not the Roman emperor. The Roman emperor at this time is Claudius, uh, is the emperor Claudius. This is King Herod Agrippa II of Galilee, who is a local ruler. These kings were not kings, proper kings. They were, uh, the title given to them by the Romans was ethnarch. They really have no authority, like in the Roman structure, right? Like if it was the king of Galilee versus the governor, the governor would has the authority because the governor is a Roman, actual Roman, you know, he's, he's an actual Roman authority where the Kings were not these Kings though in Judea. Um, <clears throat> so like, for example, this King Herod Agrippa is the son of Herod Agrippa, the first who was, uh, who killed St. James, the apostle and imprisoned St. Peter at the beginning of this book, right? This is the, that's the, that's his father and his father. So the grandfather of this King Agrippa is Herod, the great, who was the 
king, the ethnarch, at the time that Jesus was born. And he was the one that slaughtered the innocents. So this is like a family line. So Herod the Great was not like the king. He was not like the sole ruler of that area. He was the ruler of the people, right? The Romans were not interested in the people, right? They were not interested in the Jews. They have no need for the Jews. They want the resources. They want the roads. They want all that stuff. So they use these kings, like puppet kings, basically, as a tool to kind of control the people, you know, to, to take care of small matters, right, to get, to get things off the plates of their governors. So they really had no authority in the long run. They were really just like a means to an end. So, for, uh, so what we know is that in 70 AD, when the Jews revolt and the Romans destroy the city, this, king, this kingship is just, it's just abolished, basically. There's no more kings after that. So um, that's, this is what we're talking about. So King Agrippa is actually coming to pay homage to the governor Festus, right? As the new governor, Agrippa and Bernice are coming there to greet the new governor because they're under his, they're under his you know, jurisdiction. You know, they answer to him as the Roman governor. So um, that's who we're talking about here. And so this is the same, this is in the same bloodline as, like I said, Herod the Great, who, you know, was the, was the, was the king at the time that uh, Jesus was born. And in subsequent generations, like after Herod the Great died, his kingdom was separated into four kingdoms, it was given to his sons. So now, like, now that king is even, like, less, right? It means even less than when Herod the Great was the king. Because now, he, instead of having all of Judea, it's like, now he has Galilee, which is, like, nothing. I mean, really, there's nothing to it, right? And it was only over the people, the matters of the people. So I just wanted to make clear, because I, I remember, like, growing up, for some reason, I, like, had a misconception about who this Agrippa was. Like, he was, like, some little more powerful personality, but... Um, but he's not, but he's, I mean, he's still someone of importance, but he's not like the Caesar, you know what I mean? He's not, that's not who he is. So now he comes and he comes to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to the uh, when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. So he gives he gives basically a little recap of what's been happening. So catch a catch a grip up to you know, get him up to speed. Um, notice the way that he write presents the he presents the proceedings basically is that you know he didn't really see anything wrong with saint paul right um that they had kind of drummed up all these accusations but when he heard the case finally it really was as he said right it's not it wasn't what i thought it was right he was expecting some very serious like crimes you know a, a criminal a very serious criminal in front of him and he was like i didn't really see that it's also clear that festus like doesn't understand why the jews are so upset with him he doesn't understand the you know the religious dispute that's going on here right he goes oh they're talking about some guy named jesus who died and paul says he's alive right like he he has no concept of what's going on right so festus festus though uh is hoping that agrippa can fill him in because festus being the ethnarch being l leader of those people would have been more would have been more acquainted with the things happening in that area among his people right because he's actually you know that's what he's in charge of so he's hoping that Agrippa will kind of fill him in. Um, once again, right, St. Luke is building for us the case so that, the, that the Jewish leaders just have it out for St. Paul and will do anything to get rid of him, right? He's showing St. Paul as like a victim, not as the criminal, right? He's, he's being tried as a criminal. St. Luke is showing us that he's actually the victim in this case. He's also pointing to the fact that St. Paul and the church are not dangerous. Remember, at this time, this is what the Jews, the Jewish leadership was telling the Romans about the Christians, right? That 
the Christians are dangerous, right? Well, St. Paul, St. Luke here is showing through St. Paul, right? That like, there's nothing dangerous about St. Paul. There's nothing dangerous about the church. So this is an important, you know, historical note for us to, that that's what St. Luke, one of the things St. Luke is trying to do. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would also like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow he said, you shall hear him. So here we, again, we have like another opportunity, right? Again, another trial, but another t another chance for St. Paul to speak, you know, another chance for St. Paul to bear witness um, to now another, another person, again, not of the ultimate importance, but somebody who was somewhat important in that, in that region. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are present with you, with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So... St. Luke here, again, is making a contrast for us. Right? Like the scene opens with this like grand entrance of Agrippa and Bernice, you know, with the commanders and the, the kind of, you know, the, the uh, people uh, of, no, you know, the noteworthy people of that region, right? They, they have this like big ceremony, basically, for them to enter into the auditorium. So it's an outward show of like power, which as we know, as we just talked about, is an empty power, right, for Agrippa and Bernice. There's not really any real authority there. Um, and yet what we've seen continually through the Acts of the Apostles, right, is like the power and glory of God being revealed and, and worked through his humble disciples, right? He's right, St. Peter, a poor fisherman from Galilee, you know, working all these signs and wonders. So the world may puff up certain people and make them look like they're more important than they actually are. But really, God's glory is manifested in, in the humble. So St. Luke is making this juxtaposition here. You know, the, the way that we can think about, right, like if, if, if these men, right, if Felix and Festus and Agrippa had never met St. Paul, if they weren't involved in the life of St. Paul, none of us would know who they were, right? Like nobody would know who Festus and Felix and Agrippa were if they didn't meet St. Paul, right? If they were not involved in this life of St. Paul, we would have no idea who they were. St. Paul, on the other hand, of course, is known throughout the world. I mean, his, you know, his, uh, his writings, literally, like we say in the church, right, their voice has gone out into all the earth. So St. Paul, 2,000 years later, you know, his memory is, is living strong. These guys are like a footnote in his life, basically, in his life story. So, again, St. Luke is, is, uh, is showing us where the real glory is. Uh, here we get the reason, right, why um, Festus wants Agrippa in on this. So in the appeal to Caesar right now, Festus has to send Paul, St. Paul to Rome. He has to send St. Paul there. But he has to, like, you know, explain the case and explain what's going on and why he's being sent to Rome and why he's appealing to the emperor. But he basically tells them, I don't know what to put down. He's basically, that's what basically what, what Festus says, right? Like, I don't know what to write in the case summary. Because I don't know what the, I don't understand the charges against him. And I don't understand why he's being held prisoner. That's basically what he's saying here. So he, uh, and he would have looked really foolish, right? To send this prisoner to this, to the emperor without any charges in place. Like, why is he a prisoner if there's no charges? So it would have made Festus look completely incapable of doing his job, which could have resulted in him being removed from his position or worse. So Agrippa, now he's hoping Agrippa can hear the case and help him to discern what the charges are so that he can send Paul on his way, St. Paul on his way. So now we're in the chap first verse of chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself in the, like the form of like an ancient orator, you know, like you like see in the paintings, he's got like, his hand stretched out. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert 
in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. So here we have an, a fulfillment of what we heard in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, which is the calling of St. Paul. Uh, but, but the Lord said to him, meaning Ananias, if you remember, St. Paul is like blind in Damascus. And the Lord comes to Ananias and tells him to go to St. Paul and baptize him. And, and he says, really, St. Paul, or like, it's really Saul. Saul's the one that's persecuting us, et cetera, et cetera. The Lord says to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So we have that now fulfilled, right? Here's Paul, St. Paul. He's standing now before the king. Uh, we will, uh, in now St. Paul's testimony, what we'll see is that he's going to focus not on the charges that the Jews bring against him. But not, he's not going to focus on defending himself. He's going to focus on his faith in Christ and on his service to Christ, uh, because this is the essence of why he's on trial, right? Like he's not going to go through and be like, this is why this should be dismissed. And this is why this should be dismissed. He's going to make the case. He's going to basically point to why he believes in Christ and why that isn't a crime, you know? So, um, so that's how, so now St. Paul begins his, um, his defense and he begins a little bit here with like, uh, you know, a little flattery, you know, to Agrippa, you're an expert, right? You're an expert in all things Jewish. So I, I, I have faith that you'll understand, you know, what I'm going to tell you. So uh, this is very common in the ancient world. You know, we saw this in when the, um, when the Jews came before, uh, it wasn't Felix. It was one of the other Roman leaders, right? And they, with charges and they like, were like really flattering him. And then basically they threw him out of the court, you know? <laughs> So we've seen this before. So St. Paul begins with a little, little flattery, as is customary. Uh, but he does make a point, right, that Agrippa is in a unique position to hear St. Paul because he's more familiar with the customs of the Jews. He's more familiar with their religion. Uh, he's more familiar with the scriptures because he's, again, he, those are the people that he's, he's ruling over. Um, so he's in a better position than like Festus to verify what St. Paul is, is saying. Because as we've seen, Festus is pretty much just clueless at this point. He has no idea what's going on. Uh, so we're now in verse 4. St. Paul now is speaking. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am, ju and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. So St. Paul here begins by, begins by stating, right, that he grew up as a good Jew. And he's always been a good Jew, right? That he's, he, he grew up as a Pharisee, which was the strictest, you know, the strictest group in Judaism. And, uh, he believes in the hope of the resurrection as God promised to their fathers and as they pray night and day. Uh, and this is what he's being, this is what he's being charged on. Um, so his faith in Jesus, in other words, is not in opposition to his Jewish background. It comes out of his Jewish background, right? He's basically saying like, look, I'm one of them, right? Like I am, I'm like them. I'm a Pharisee like them. I was raised in Jerusalem. I, I was raised as a Pharisee. And I believe in the resurrection. And the reason he's, of course, is being tried is not only that he believes in the resurrection, but that the resurrection has come, right? That the Messiah has come and has is the first one now to be raised from the dead. So um, St. Paul basically is preaching that this hope has been fulfilled, right? This hope of the Messiah coming, this hope of the resurrection has now happened, right? Has, has, this is, Jesus has come. And it's fulfilled these prophecies. And this is why he's being imprisoned and tried and persecuted from place to place. Because the Jews uh, stand in opposition to him. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So he's already established, right, that he was raised a Pharisee. He identifies with them. 
but he's now shows right that he once was even doing the same things that they're doing now to him right he says right that's basically what he just said right that i used to persecute the christians just the way that i'm being persecuted now right he even says right to foreign cities well where is he now he's in a foreign city right like he's like literally i used to put people in the same situation that i'm in now so i but what he's saying there is like i understand where they're coming from i get the mentality right i used to do the same thing to to the believers in jesus that that they're doing to me right he even makes a, a reference there to the martyrdom of saint stephen right the that he cast his vote to execute him, you know, to have him killed. Now here's where the switch comes. While thus occupied, meaning that he was persecuting everybody, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we can tell that St. Luke thinks that the story of St. Paul coming to faith in Christ is really important because this is now the third time <clears throat> in this book of 28 chapters that uh, he's, a, he's told the story, that he shared it again. So this happens, I believe, in chapter 9 of Acts of the Apostles. So from chapter 9 to chapter 20, 26, we get three, it's accounted, it's recounted three times. So we know that for St. Luke, this is like a centerpiece story. You know, this is really, really important. Um, we get some extra details this time, right? Like we get more of what Christ told St. Paul here, right? That I'm going to send you to the Gentiles and, you know, this is why, you know, you're going to bring them, you know, you're going to... Uh, to open their eyes to bring them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So uh, St. Paul's coming to faith, his calling to faith, his calling to be an apostle is serves on works on two levels. First of all, it's an, it's a proof of the resurrection of Jesus, right? If Jesus was crucified and died, then how could this man in this vision have had such a change of heart if, if he hadn't resurrected, right? The only way, that St. Paul could have gone from this raving persecutor and murderer to an apostle preaching the resurrected Christ is if, if Jesus is alive and actually appeared to him on the road, right? So that's the first level. The second is, right, St. Paul asked a question earlier, right? Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? So it may seem incredible, right? It may seem crazy, but St. Paul is sharing his own experience, right? This is what happened. This is, this is my experience. I saw him. He talked to me right after he had died. So this is the foundation of why St. Paul believes that Jesus is the Messiah and that he has risen from the dead. This is the starting point of his work and his ministry and why he did, why he has been doing what he's been doing. So, and opposed, opposite of what the Jews are saying about him, his work is not to take Jews away from the law, but to bring all nations to the kingdom of God, right? Like he's not trying to take Jews out of, away from God, right? He's not, that's not what his goal is. His goal is to bring all the other nations back in. And this goes back to like the, all the way back to Genesis, where you have the story of the Tower of Babel and the nations are scattered and God basically disowns them and allows them for a time to wander in their own paths. But now in Christ, in Pentecost, in the, in the church, God has called all those nations back. And St. Paul has started that work, right? Which had already started before him, right? With the, again, with Pentecost that had already started. Um, and now St. Paul, again, is working to bring all those people back to God, to not have them be subject to bondage under Satan, to be living in darkness, but to be with God again 
So this is the ministry of St. Paul. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other thing than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So, St. Paul basically, again, recounts here that I did what the vision told me, right? I did what Christ Jesus told me in the vision, which, I mean, if you have a if you have that kind of vision, you probably should listen. Uh, so he went, you know, he went out and, and carried out that mission. And this is what he did, right? This is what he's been telling people, right? That they should repent and come back to God and do works fitting of repentance, right? And then he says, this is why they're, this is why they're seized me and are trying to kill me, right? That I went and preached repentance, basically, right? I told people to come back to God and repent and they wanted to kill me. He's showing how ridiculous their claims are, right? And he's saying, and all the things I taught are in agreement with the prophets and, and everything that has been spoken before, right? And, and been written in the scriptures. Um, everything that I preach basically is what the prophets have said. And yet again, you know, they, they're trying to kill him constantly. And it's only by the grace of God that he's still standing there before them all. So the, he, he even points like to the fact that the fact that I'm here standing here, even though they've tried to kill me so many times, is testimony that God is with me. God is on my side because it's through his grace that I'm here. Um, so this is St. Paul now defending his work, defending his, and really, again, showing like why he believes in Christ, you know, why he believes in Jesus as the Messiah and why uh, everything that he's, why he's done everything that he's done, right? Why he serves the Lord. Um, and what what is the nature of his mission and how it doesn't stand in opposition to the beliefs of the Pharisees anyway, right? That this is in line with everything they teach. They're just missing that one key component, which is that Jesus is the Messiah. So now we're in verse uh, 24. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. So uh, as he's speaking, Festus, the governor, who clearly still doesn't, is not grasping, you know, what this is, what's going, what St. Paul's talking about, says, oh man, you're, you're beside yourself. You're crazy. This is crazy talk, right? Basically, that's what he says. This is all crazy talk. And St. Paul responds very politely, right? Very with nobility and grace and dignity, right? I'm not mad in the most noble Festus, but these are words of truth and reason. Really what he, what he, what a better translation could be, or another translation is like truth and good judgment, right? He's saying like, you think I'm crazy, but these are the words of good judgment, actually. So St. Paul basically says that everything I just told you is, is perfectly sane perfectly sound and then he turns to agrippa right who's the king that's hearing his case at this point and says and i know and you may not understand festus what i'm talking about but i know king agrippa does because he understands the scriptures he understands the prophets and he understands and he's aware of all these things that have been happening because we did not nothing was done in secret right he says nothing was done in a corner right that means that everything that the, all the events of the gospel and all the all everything the apostles did didn't happen in secret, but was done and was widely known. So he's he St. Paul knows that Agrippa is aware of the things that um, St. Paul is not testifying about and what all the apostles have been testifying about. Uh, he was St. Uh, Agrippa also would have been familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, according to St. Paul, right? He says, do you believe in the prophets, right? Like that St. Paul asks him that question. Do you believe in the prophets? And he says, I know you believe in the prophets. So he also would be familiar with the writings of the prophets and again, would be able to say if St. Paul was correct in what he was saying, or if he was saying something incorrect. Um, this is not why he brings Agrippa into the conversation to verify again what he's, what he's saying. 
Notice here, though, that St. Paul kind of turns the tables, right? St. Paul is supposed to be defending himself. And yet, what does he do here, right? He, he, tur he puts the pressure now on Agrippa to say yes or no, right? To say, to use his knowledge of the scriptures, to accept his testimony, to say, yes, this is what St. Paul is saying is correct, that, or to say that he's incorrect. You know, he's putting the pressure on to say, like, look, Agrippa, you know the prophets, right? They they told they said a Messiah would come, that he would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead. And now and you know what happened with Jesus, and this is the fulfillment of that. He's he's pressuring him to say that St. Paul's right. Right. So St. Paul has now turned the tables on Agrippa, and he's kind of like putting him on the spot. He's preaching and he's trying to he's trying to get him to to convert. He's trying to get him to accept Jesus as as the Messiah. So now we're in verse uh, 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So <coughs> Agrippa answers him with like a little kind of like sly comment there, right? Like, oh, you're so close to convincing me to become a Christian. Not, 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 a, not good enough, but pretty close, St. Paul. It was a pretty good defense, right? You, you did a pretty good job. He almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Also, the fact that he uses the term Christian, again, shows, right, that he's aware of what's happening, right? He under he knows who the Christians are. He knows what they teach and, and what, they're, what they're preaching is. So it shows that St. Paul's right, that he is aware of, of them and what's been going on. And St. Paul answers Agrippa, again, like you can imagine Agrippa kind of like, again, he, he, it's, supposed, it's like intended to be a little humorous, but St. Paul uses those words and takes it very seriously, right? He's like, yes, I wish that you would, not only you, but all of you, right? I wish all of you would be like me, except for these chains, right? So he throws in his own little humor there, right? Like, I don't, I don't want you to be prisoners, but I want you to have, be faithful in Christ. You know, I want you to come and believe in Christ. So, um, so yes, that is indeed his hope, right? That, that Agrippa and Festus and everybody there would uh, indeed accept Jesus as the Messiah um, without, of course, being in chains as he is. And so now we get to the end of chapter 26 here, last few verses. When he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So once again, the local authority now has heard St. Paul and does not believe that he's deserving a punishment. This is not, again, he's been passed now. This is like the, what, the third or fourth trial he's gone through. And every time the Roman or, again, King Agrippa in this case, they don't believe he's guilty or deserving of death. So St. Saint, Saint Luke is, again, making that point, right? That, like, look, this is why St. Paul's been in prison for so long. This is why he's being persecuted. It's the madness of the Jews against him. It's not that he's a criminal. It's not that he's some dangerous person. It's not that the church is dangerous, right? He's making, he's building that case for the church, right? Like, we're not the dangerous ones. We're not the ones causing all these problems. The, this is the injustice and, again, the, the kind of the mania of the Jewish leadership against uh, St. Paul. Uh, you know, Agrippa, again, could have worked with Festus here to release him. But at this point, because uh, he's already appealed to Caesar, that means that he has to go to Rome, right? His, the appeal has to move forward and for him to go to Rome. So again, even though he's still a prisoner and even though he's still going through all these trials and tribulations, literally, um, it means that the gospel is going to be furthered, that he's going to you now go preach in a new place to new people, uh, that he's going to go now to Rome, the capital of the empire, and he's going to have lots of opportunities there to, to speak, to write, you know, and, and to continue spreading the gospel. So that now brings us to the end of chapter 26, which is where we will wrap up tonight. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Going once, going twice. Well, thank you guys for being on the call tonight uh, on, right. on, this, on this Valentine's night. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Yeah, happy Valentine's Nice haircut, Father. <laughs> it was time. It was time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. And like I said, next week, God willing, we'll gather again and, uh, and finish off the Acts of the Apostles. So may it be blessed. Thank you all. Have a good night. All right.